Welcome to our ongoing uh, series of videos on load zone buildings. We're in chapter 2, section 2, uh, subsection 3, and this is our third video which we're labeling video C. We're going to look at the equation W equals PS which we uh, derived in a previous video and in this particular video we're going to focus on example calculations. As to refresh your memory, W is the line distributed load along a beam or truss or some other spanning member in pounds per foot or kips per foot. P is the area distributed load of the floor or decking that's being supported by the spanning member. And S is uh, starts off, we think of it as the spacing of the joist or whatever that's supporting the decking but you can also think of it as the width of floor that's being supported along the length of the spanning member. We're going to focus on a two-story building that has a bottom floor that's a slab on grade and one elevated floor above that's got a decking that's composite corrugated steel and concrete decking um, and, the frame, and then of course there's a roof above that. The framing plans for both the second floor and the roof are both as depicted in the following diagram. Each of these circles represents a column um, and this is a sort of abstraction and that, that might be a tubular column, uh, it might be a wide flange, but for the moment we're just going to represent it as a circle. Um, so there are nine columns all together, three along this row, three along this row, and three along this one, and the spacing from column to column center line in every case is 30 feet, so that's 30 feet, this is 30 feet, and this is 30 feet. Um, again, we're depicting uh, beams as simple lines, so every one of these lines represents a, a, a lightweight beam, so it's rendered in a lightweight line. Um, the members here are special members because they'll be supporting part of the floor, but also they'll support the wall. Uh, so we don't know at the, mo at the moment exactly what loads to attribute to that. So we're going to focus on these inner members, which we sometimes call joists, or we may call them secondary beams but they're not secondary in the sense that they're, they are the, the beams that are most directly supporting the decking. So in this case, the corrugations of the decking would run in this direction to span from joist to joist. The joists are not shown going, going all the way to the girder or along this line all the way to the column. Uh, that's to indicate that the support at the end of that joist is not a moment connection but is a pin joint uh, this would be something like a clip angle connection that has very little resistance in terms of bending type action in the direction in which the joist is ex exerting its bending action. So it's a simple clip angle connection at the end. We show a similar failure of this interior girder to have any kind of moment connection to the column. In chapter 3 we'll talk more about the whole meaning of moment connections, but for the moment we're just going to focus on what kinds of loads are, are uh, associated with each of these beams. So before we get too deep into that though, we need to specify some loads. P roof uh, dead for the roof. P the area distributed uh, weight of the roof, uh, which we're calling P roof dead. We're going to take to be 20 pounds a square foot. Um, typically we can design a much lighter weight roof than that, but we may have unknown future loads that we want to design for, so typically we'll never take less than 20 pounds a square foot for the roof load. Um, for the live load on the roof, uh, snow load in Raleigh, North Carolina would be 15 pounds a square foot, but we have to design for 20 pounds a square foot of uh, load from workers on the roof doing maintenance or upgrades. So those two loads uh, end up being the same quantity in this particular problem. If this was a concrete roof or a concrete structure, this number for the dead load would be much higher, but in the case of steel, 
it's such an efficient structural material that the weight of the roof is typically less than 10 pounds a square foot. Then we have area distributed uh, loads associated with the floor, the dead load of the slab and uh, various stuff hanging off the slab is 53 pounds per square foot and the live load on the floor is prescribed to be 100 pounds per square foot for this particular problem. Now we want to talk about influence areas uh, which have to do with how much floor effectively loads each of these beams. So if we take a joist, we say it supports halfway to the next joist in that direction and halfway to the next joist in that direction. So if the spacing from joist to joist is five feet, then that means this joist is responsible for a strip of floor that's five feet wide and the length of that joist. When we go look at a perimeter girder, we discover it has no load on this side because there's no floor out there, but it does support the floor halfway to the next girder. So in other words, it's responsible for this amount of floor, uh, basically 15 feet wide, running the full length of that beam. When we go to an interior girder, it's supporting halfway to this girder and halfway to that one. So in other words, it's supporting floor 15 feet on each side of it, or a total width of floor that it's supporting of 30 feet. So now we're going to do some calculations and we're going to focus on the floor. Uh, the calculations for the roof would be exactly similar except that um, we'd have different dead and live loads that we would be accounting for. So our formula is W is equal to PS. In this case, we say that W dead for the floor joist is P dead for the floor times the width of uh, floor being supported by the floor joist. So we said that we were told at the beginning of the problem that the dead load of the floor decking and associated loads on it um, such as ducts or whatever might be hung off of it. Um, that load is 50 pounds a square foot. We already ascertained that the width of floor associated with that joist is five feet. Uh, when we multiply those two together, we get 265 pounds per foot. Now you'll notice in this example, I have converted that to kips per foot um, by multiplying a kip per thousand pounds, which is basically another way of writing one. So I, I end up with a thousand pounds in the denominator or the other way of looking at it is I have shifted the decimal from right here all the way over to there. So I have uh, 0.265 kips per foot. Um, I'm doing that by the way because some software programs uh, only accept data in kips per foot. In fact, that's kind of the industry standard. And so one of the most common mistakes that we make uh, in, when we start off in this field is we start with numbers that are in pounds per foot. We calculate this number in pounds per foot and then we go put that number in the computer program and the computer program interprets that as 265 kips per foot. And the results uh, turn out to be really quite horrifying. Um, because you're basically overloading your structure by a factor of a thousand. So you'd like to not make that mistake and give yourself a heart attack. And so one of the things you should think about first and foremost is as soon as you get this number, ask yourself what it is in kips also. All right, so we have 0.265 kips per foot for the dead load associated with the floor joist. Now the live load associated with the floor joist is the P live load for the floor uh, times the width of floor supported by the floor joist. So the live load is 100 pounds per square foot. The width of floor is five feet. Five times 100 is 500. 
and it's in units of pounds per foot. And when we convert that to kips per foot, we slide the decimal over three places and we end up with 0.5 kips per foot. Now, when we go to calculate total strength or try to account for total strength, we do it using the total factored load, in this case for the Floyd joist, is going to be the load factor for dead load, which we take to be 1.2. So in other words, we're jacking up whatever we've calculated the, the, the dead load to be. We're increasing that by 20% uh, to give us a margin of safety. And then we're going to multiply the lab load factor of 1.6 times 0 0.5 kips per foot, which is the live load that we, line distributed live load that we calculated up here. So um, we have a higher load factor for the live load to reflect the fact that we're less certain about what it is. So we only use 1.2 for dead loads, but 1.6 for live loads. And when we um, do this computation, we end up with a, a total factored load for the floor joist of 1.118 kips per foot. Now we're going to go look at a perimeter girder and again we're still looking at the floor we haven't gone on to the roof yet and we probably won't do the roof because that's something I would like for all of you to run through yourselves to convince yourself that you understand this. So W dead for the floor perimeter girder which is this or that or one of these over on this side. It's going to equal P dead for the floor times the width of floor being supported by the perimeter girder. Uh, the dead area distributed dead load on the floor is 53 pounds per square foot. The spacing supported by the perimeter girder is 15 feet. We get that from up here. So when we multiply those together, we get 795 pounds per foot, which is equal to 0 0.795 kips per foot. We can do the same kind of calculation for the live load on the floor perimeter girder. It's going to be P live on the floor times the width of floor supported by the perimeter girder, which is 100 pounds per square foot of live load times a width of 15 feet. That's 1,500 pounds per foot or 1.5 kips per foot. Again, we're going to calculate the total factored load. Um, and by the way, we typically are concerned about two things. We're concerned about doing some kind of deflection calculation associated with this live load to assure that our structure doesn't move too much. This might be to avoid cracking of interior partitions under floor movement, or it might be to reduce people's perception of movement in the floor, which is often a source of um, uncertainty and anxiety, um, or, or many building occupants or owners perceive a flexible or moving structure is a sign that is somehow weak or low quality. So often we end up uh, having our designs governed by this need for stiffness, which is associated with W Live. But the most important thing, of course, is overall strength, which we get from do W total factored. Again, it's the dead load factor at 1.2 times the dead load plus the live load factor of 1.6 times the live load. So this number is put down here, that number is put right there, and we get 3.354 kips per foot. And this number actually has to be three times the previous number because everything is the same here except that we've gone from a five foot width to a 15 foot width. Nothing else has changed. So if we wanted to, we could have gotten the information we need here and there by just multiplying this number that we got here uh, by the additional width or the increasing it by the factor of three. Now we'll go to an interior girder. W dead on the floor interior girder is P dead on the floor times 
the width of floor being supported by that girder. In this case, it's uh, 30 feet across here. Um, so we have 53 pounds a square foot for a P dead floor. We have a width of 30 feet that's supported. That comes out to 1,590 pounds per foot, or in other words, 1.59 kips per foot. Uh, w live on the floor interior girder is P live on the floor times the spacing that the girder uh, supports, which is 30 feet. That's the width of, of floor that the girder is supporting. So we have 100 pounds per square foot, which is the live load, times the width of floor that's being supported by the interior girder. That turns out to be 3,000 pounds per foot, or 3.0 kips per foot. Finally, we get the total factored load for the floor interior girder by applying our load factor to the dead load and the live load factor to the live load and we end up with 6.708. This number is twice what we got for that and it's six times what we've got for the joist. That concludes our video uh, giving example calculations of W equals PS and as I mentioned it would be really good if you went through and repeated these calculations for the roof just to persuade yourself that you understand how they're done.